Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Soto. I'm a uh, family physician. I'm also a faculty working with uh, medical students in my practice. I you know, also do some uh, authoring, you know, uh, research and explorer. I've been in the Everspace camp, Kilimanjaro, I like mountaineering, different parts of the world exploring. Um, I want to thank the Mars Society for this opportunity, you know, to bring today some ideas that I think need to be um, uh, readdressed. Um, there's no discoveries here or anything, but it, it's some ideas that need to be retaken. First of all, we know that uh, the Mars doctor has to be, will have to be dealing with a lot of stressors and on the crew. And, and we know space exploration have pro multiple problems, especially, especially with more motion sickness which has been studied since the very beginning of the space age, actually from the very beginning of aviation. Uh, the immunity uh, system also changed, not only in the activity of the cells of the immune system, but also in the number of cells that are achieved in the white blood cells. Anemia can develop as part of the uh, problems faced in the space. And interesting, muscle loss, look at this. This is an, uh, a study published in the Journal of Applied Physiology, and it, this is a abductus longus, is a long muscle, anti-gravity muscle in rats. And look at the muscle fiber here. Remind me a little bit of the churrasco steaks in uh, uh, in the market that we eat. But look at that when she comes to Earth. So you know this is analyzed on Earth only nine days after staying on space. A lot of atrophy. There's a lot of space occupied by collagen tissue and fat. So there is this, you know loss of muscle uh, activity, muscle, m loss of muscle strength, also bone loss. And that brings to another problem, which is a lot of calcium being in the blood system, which leads to another problem, which is renal calculi. And we have had in low orbital mission on space missions, we have had a promise with renal uh, calculus, renal kidney, kidney stones uh, that have been appearing in astronauts um, that were totally unexpected by the, the support um, ground crew. Uh, all of these problems are tied up also with radiation, which the exposure to radiation we know is detrimental to the human body. And we know it's, it's linked to cancer, there's no discovery. But radiation also produces other problems that I don't know the incidence in astronauts. Cancer in astronauts is low. Radiation has another problem, which is also can produce cataracts in people, can produce weakness, tiredness, um, and definitely that can have an impact on the immune system radiation as well, and possibly on anemia. So it's not only radiation and cancer, there are other aspects of radiation that we need to keep track of. Um, need, needless to say, this is a, one of the spaces used, you know, the capsule to return, but a confinement, you know, it's a very tight spaces um, and social separation. Even though social separation is uh, voluntary, people are isolated. Even in the orbit that they keep communications with the rest of friends or maybe staff and uh, Earth crew, uh, still they are separated from the society. Imagine now going at least uh, 18 months in the trip back and forth. Uh, imagine that. Other stressors include noise, which the astronauts complain consistently about the high level of noise in the space uh, spaceships and uh, the rations, you know, everything is limited. And food, it has not only a nutritional value on the space exploration, food is also important because uh, it has a psychological impact in the crew. So uh, these are some of the food that definitely do not have to be taken to space, but it's actually so important because it brings emotion. It, you know, needless to say, you have a glass of wine, a beer, a chocolate, a coffee, and that triggers something because that is uh, actually stimulating the brain at the hypothalamus level where a lot of emotions are um, accumulated or generated in that area. Uh, so a lot of comfort food has been brought to space also, also nutritional, definitely. But um, do we need to carry to space a uh, soda machine? Not necessarily, but still, it was taken to space to provide that sense of comfort and amenities to, to the astronauts. So the psychological aspects are very important. I will say as important or more important than the physical preparation for the astronauts. So psychological and physical preparation and countermeasures are really important. So the Mars Desert Regis, uh, uh, Mars Desert um, Research Stations and other Mars analogs are, have been really valuable, I believe, because they have provided a lot of data, ton of information about how to address multiple problems. The uh, use of alternative medicine like yoga, meditation, 
uh, video games, arts, art, um, arts and crafts, table games. All of these activities are really important when we're going to be isolated in a space. When I was in Everest Base Camp and you're tired, you're exhausted, you're in extreme conditions, it's so nice to get, you know, the 4G right there and, you know, uh, get in touch with your friends and family members or uh, Facebook uh, fans, whatever. And it's really important. It brings a sense of happiness, a, a sense of connection with your mission, what we are doing. Um, important also for many people is going to be the religious support. So it's important uh, also be in contact with friends, uh, with all the workers, birthday anniversary. So the astronauts are going to have a lot of protocols to run during deep space exploration and during the colonization of Mars, if, if that comes to be one of the first things to do. There's a debate what's going to be first. But important to have clear that between the Earth and the Moon, I mean, so the Earth, between the Earth and the Moon, this is called cislunar space. Most of our research has been done around the Earth in low orbit or in the Moon. When you go further from the moon to Mars or other celestial celestial bodies, Deimos, Phobos, wherever you go, that is called deep space. This is the deep space that we have. And that's what we are addressing. We need to know that we don't know everything that is going to happen in Mars, especially because there are things from nature that we cannot predict, even with the best probe that we have sent. There are things that are escaping to perception, to analysis, to uh, creativity. And for example, Eugene Cernan, the great astronaut, and he was complaining, look at that face, he's not happy right there, he's not happy. But he was complaining of this, the presence of lunar dust. It was completely irritating for the astronauts. He described that the lunar uh, dust got everywhere, in the suits, in the lenses, in the eyes, in the nose. Not only that, when it was analyzed here on Earth with electron microscopy, I don't think it was available in that time, probably later, uh, we, we found that there was, there was a lot of, uh, or it was found, not me, I mean, we are suspicious. We found that it was very irritating to the skin, to the human tissues, and it has, there, is, there were biological activity against that dust. So I think in Mars we may have, we might be facing that problem and maybe other problems, smell. You know, we know by the proof that perchlorate, methane, and other gases might be there, and that can pass to the spaceships and can uh, the smell. Even when you, you are able to extract, you know, the gases still might be some sense of uh, inappropriate smell, I would say. And although humans are able to adjust real quick and develop tolerance to bad smell uh, or even regular smells, it's important to keep that in mind as a possible stressor. Uh, death and dying in a space. This is a very serious topic that nobody, nobody likes to talk about, but it's something we need to address as physicians. Uh, we are going to send probably the best people, the more trained, the better studied, the perfect bodies that we can find, the most perfect individuals that we can find. However, that doesn't discard the possibility of dying in a space. Either accident, injuries, sudden death, which is by concept, someone who died without having any known diseases or any known causes that would possibly lead to uh, possibly lead to death and that could happen so that it would be immediately a global news it would be i remember the times when the three cosmonauts soviet cosmonauts died i went in havana to sign uh, the book of condolence and a lot of people were there signing voluntarily it was not one of those things ordered by the government this was something that people did Voluntarily, it becomes immediately uh, uh, a global uh, uh, news. Uh, the deaths of these three great astronauts um, back when the, the, the times that we were running for the moon uh, also com uh, it was something, was a commotion for the whole community. Um, so dying in a space is very important. If this event gets to happen, the whole world will know in minutes and it can really threat the whole mission. So that's why it's also important to have a physician on board. Uh, it is important not only have the physician on board, but a different physician, and we'll talk more. If someone happened to die in the spaceship after a series of events, we need to take care of that body. What will happen? Only two circumstances will, um, uh, will be very important to bury the astronaut, either if we are arriving to a celestial body or if we are returning to Earth in the immediate 48 hours or so. Uh, the, the exact time it needs to be determined by the, the people who, who can study this further down. But 
if we are about to get into Mars and somebody, a member of the crew, die, it could be buried on the celestial body. Uh, in the meantime, in the space, if an astronaut die, it needs to be isolated. It is my idea that it needs to be put back inside the spacesuit. We need to prepare the spacesuit like this astronaut is going to go for an extravehicular activity and then proceed with a ceremony and do a burial in a space fire following the Navy tradition of burial at sea. Uh, this is not going to be easy. It's going to be followed by a period of mourning, sadness. Uh, this is very serious because astronauts will fear, will feel the fear of dying. Um, they are humans. They are trained, but they are humans. They, they are uh, emotionally involved with this loss. There's going to be someone lost in the space in the spaceship that has a lot of skills and abilities that might be needed. Uh, and this, of course, will need a, a lot of uh, mission uh, support from the, uh, the ground crew and follow the possible medical uh, implications of mourning and bereavement. Uh, this will be very important until they reach the reorganization phase. They might be feelings of blaming, uh, feelings of guilt. Um, all of this could happen as part of a normal mourning process. If we have lost some, somebody has lost uh, someone dear, know how, what the feelings are and how this process take care. Well, we have one, at least one and a half year, maybe two years for going back and forth um, and in this process. So it is really, really important uh, to keep this in mind. Uh, definitely, we cannot keep the same model that we are uh, using, even though we have achieved a lot of things in aerospace medicine. Uh, this is the original class, the first class in 1922 of fly surgeons. And aerospace medicine is actually uh, doing great things in medicine. Uh, doctors from NASA are advancing medicine a lot, uh, dealing with a lot of different situations. But it's not, not a single medical specialty can cover the traveling to Mars. Not even one single specialty, not even one single specialty with some add-ons. So let's get an orthopedic and with experience in traumatology, and let's make him a primary care physician or vice versa. It's not going to work that way. Long-term missions involve a lot of months and a lot of possible uh, problems. There is a need for the astronauts to have a face-to-face -face encounter. It's not going to be enough to speak with a doctor on a screen. They will probably prefer uh, to see a physician and have the physician in front of them. And actually, there is a difference in management in results, I guess. Uh, need of multiple skills, it will be needed multiple skills in that physician, not only a physician, but also an astronaut or someone who knows how to do other protocols and other things on space. And another important problem is, is we have a very distant support system. If we think that if anything happened, we will call Earth and they will let us what to do, how about if there is a you know, solar flare, if there are storms, if the communications are broken, if the equipment is defective or something happened? So we are going to lose communications. We need someone on board that help the crew. So it is important, again, a physician being there. Medication expiration is a problem. Uh, we are not going to have uh, uh, probably enough medication or medication to cover all the possible problems that last for two years. So this is a, a, an issue that is being studied these days seriously, not with money of, from the pharmaceuticals or the pharmacy and insurance companies' uh, issues, linked to the real chemical duration or effectiveness of medications. So now, most of the medications, one to two years, we need to know if this medication will expire in one or two years, if it will expire in six months or in three years. We need to know exactly, and then studies has to be done and needs to be readdressed. So the role of the physician has evolved from this time. So we cannot longer, uh, even though the, the key role of the doctor is assure survivability and make sure the pilots are uh, fit, and that was the reason they created the aerospace medicine and, and the flight surgeons, uh, was to make sure that the pilots were not passing out in those airplanes from 1922, with, maybe with the Wright brothers. Yeah. And they decided we need doctors that fly with the pilots and they will decide what needs to be done. Uh, they were at the beginning they were using for pilots soldiers that were not fit for cavalry or infantry. So imagine that they got the, 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 the from the, the universe they got one of the weakest individual and that was not good for uh, aviation. So now we are going to have a physician. We need to form a physician. 
that be not only the fly surgeon, but also a primary care physician and a dentist. Why? We are going to have problems possibly in, a, in the deep space exploration in a long time. If you remember, many of you have been this year, the previous year in the dentist, and you were not predicting that you will have a cavity or you will need a deep cleaning or something that needs to be addressed. So we don't have this model. In Spain, we do have a model that if you want to be a dentist, then you first you need to be a doctor. So that probably will lead us to this. We need a physician that also be a dentist or a dentist therapist, someone with a lot of skills that can address both problems. Not only that, the physician needs to be a psychologist, needs to have deep, needs to have deep knowledge of psychology, how to speak to a group, how to do one-to-one -one, uh, uh, sessions, how to do group therapy, how to evaluate his uh, Congress astronauts uh, on the spaceship. He needs to know how to draw blood, how to give medications, how to provide anesthesia in different ways. So these are medical specialties. Orthopedic and surgery, he needs to operate. He needs to know how to do that. So we need to start creating someone that is not formed this day in the medical school. We know someone, we know medicine, but we specialize in particular areas. And then we go to see uh, an orthopedist or a surgeon if we have a hernia or a psychologist if you want some therapy or the dentist. We need to have all that on board and can be done. It is feasible. It's, it requires times, it requires training, it requires, it requires a model, a new model of physician that we can do. Another important aspect is they will be also journalists. They will be writers, scientific writers. How many things will happen? Well, there will be new things. They, they will probably notice that the lunar dust is causing a rhinitis that is allergic and they found maybe the turbinates inside the nose swollen with a simple exploration of the nose. So they, they could figure out maybe antihistaminics will be work on that in that situation or maybe local steroids will help to the astronauts in that situation. So that's an immediate assessment that doesn't require a 22 minutes delay with earth and back and forth. So this, this will be right on board. This concept is actually very important for me is the concept of the blood donor. We need to get a crew of astronauts that if they need blood for any reason, I know I can give it to him, he can give it to her, she can give it to the three of us because she's a universal donor, uh, or we are universal recipients. We cannot keep blood in the spaceship until there and back. It will not be possible. It will be heavy, it will be tremendous. However, we can have our blood donor. Would that have an impact psychologically, psychologically if I don't feel comfortable with this astronaut? He's my blood, so I have to be careful, you know. It's important. It, it, it's another factor of cohesion, I think. I mean, subconsciously, no? Uh, of course, I, I mean, I think this group will be selected with time. They will be put to work together with time, and that will be tremendously important. Uh, the emergency medical technician, all the abilities of intubating, doing a cut down, find, finding deep veins, Remember that anything that would be done here would be done floating with the people floating. So they will need to be strapped to stretchers, to areas, so the surgeon can do the job. If an appendicitis happens, which is completely unpredictable, then uh, we need a new educational curriculum that definitely involve all these things and provide enough time for training, research, learning, and developing skills. So this surgeon will have to do surgery. If you're going to do fractures and reduction of open reduction and internal fixation of open fractures, which could happen in a space, in this time, it needs to be addressed. It needs, it needs, it needs number of skills developed. You need to know how to put a cast, and you need to do it 30 times. So it will be checked every time you do it. You put a cast, it's one time. So. Uh, and it, would be, it needs to be creative too. Maybe it needs to be done under the water, maybe it needs to be done uh, in, 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 in low orbit first before going deeper to deeper space. This, this is from uh, 1922, a medical research laboratory. We need to modernize all that. And then definitely maybe it's gonna be difficult to find one place in the whole world that can do everything. So maybe it's a multi-center academic center. So it's an academic center with multiple areas where they the students, the medical space or the space MD that is designed for this purpose go, go, is going to train. That physician, when he's going to operate in a space, is going to do things that are in extreme condition and is out of earth. Do not need to follow our protocols in earth because he will be doing malpractice probably 
for any lawyer. He would be doing my practice. You know, he did the operation. I was floating in the air. So that's by concept already my practice. You, can, you have to have the patient on the operating room, on a table, et cetera. So we need to create this physician, especially maybe a general physician, physician normal physician training, regular school, then retrain in other aspects uh, of medicine for space, as deep space exploration, and space MD. Uh, the importance of traditional medicine is critical. Uh, all the things like uh, acupuncture, digital puncture, uh, uh, massage, all of these things are important as part of the treatment, as part of the therapy. And then we're going to be saving some of the medications. Maybe for the medication, let's say no 90 day refills, because maybe those medications, we don't need to take the medications to space. Maybe we need to take only the active principles. And then the doctor, with his knowledge of, of pharmacology, and he will be trained for that, can manufacture in space the pill, compress it, so many milligrams of this and that, and then they can provide it to the patient in the space. So we can have a factor, a manufacturing uh, medication during the uh, spaceship if that is necessary. Um, in summary, we need a new physician, uh, new skills. Uh, we cannot continue with the same model, not only uh, physical, but mentally prepared for the challenges ahead. Uh, it's important that uh, in, we involve a lot of different things that are not taught today in medical school or there's not taught as a single regular specialty from the boards of specialties, at least in the United States. And I wanted to show you also this picture of Dr. Barani, who created the chair, the Barani chair, uh, in 1922 to study the vestibular problems that were presented in that time in the pilots. Pilots were complaining of complete disorientation, nothing different than we are having today. And this is a picture taken in Tokyo in one of the uh, stores. Uh, look at the difference in time and, and, and the different things that we can achieve. So we need to address other issues in deep space exploration, including sexuality, pregnancy, delivering, neonatology in space, child development. We need to address these things. We need to start thinking because I believe this is closer than what we think that uh, we are going to be soon probably and sooner probably than uh, the 2030s probably we're going to be sooner going to mars and we need to have a physician on board and we need to have a space medical doctor and we need to have a lot of good luck thank you and have a wonderful day please so your arguments uh well founded and well thought out and better than i could i could do but uh, I'm an environmental scientist, and so I'll, for 43 years, my objective professionally is to help people stay healthy by helping them uh, avoid unnecessary contamination in the environment. But I have a broader question, which is a health question, is do you believe it's possible that to prepare a, a group of people that were going to Mars to such a state of health as to significantly minimize uh, potential for the presentation of clinical Great question. I, I think the astronauts are going to be regarded as, as heroes since the moment they choose to go to space. This has to be done by individuals that know the magnitude of the changes they're going to have in their bodies, the, the pain and suffering they're going to endure, and they are willing even to die in the process of trying to achieve uh, a, something bigger than all of us. And um, yes, we can probably get with the appropriate training. I've been proposing also training in mountaineering before doing the space exploration to try trying to uh, uh, equal the effort and, and weakness developed during the mountaineering, the ascents in high altitude and extreme altitude with the arriving to Mars, which is a different gravitational space and, and the muscles are gonna be a lot weakened during the trip. But yeah, it, artificial uh, gravity will, could help with that. Exercising can help with that enormously, or at least it slow down the process. Medication, chemical elements are important also, but um, it's a question that we will have the answer once we arrive there or we get the astronauts back. Yeah, yeah go ahead. My question is about ophthalmology, uh, the changes in vision and the shape of the human eyeball and microgravity. In what is known today what one can do about that for a trip that would be 180 or 200 days long in uh, zero gravity? It's, it's, it's a great question, too. I, I, my information about that is that definitely I, there are changes in the, in, the, in the eyeball. The size of the eyeball increases. Um, there have been 
also changes back when they are in Earth. I mean, they are regression of many of them, but I don't know statistically if it happens in all the astronauts or there are residual damage or residual changes, but probably the changes are not really damaging the vision, but just changes in the shape of the eyeball. They complain, the astronauts, of uh, micro um, meteorites passing through their eyes because micro meteorites penetrate the spaceships and passes through the human body, and they have seen it. Cosmic rays. Cosmic rays, yeah. But they, they, are, they also are speak about micro meteorites, sure. so microscopic yeah. molecular. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is. But I, I honestly, I don't know what will happen. I think more study needs to be in the cislunar space, in the moon base. Uh, staying longer would give us a lot of answers. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Um, my name is Doug. I'm an urgent care physician. Oh, great. Also, also a physician. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, uh, I've done a presentation before on meeting the medical needs of a, of a growing, uh, growing settlement. Uh, and also, I've developed a website that gets into the medical, meeting the medical needs of, of, in terms of having the right medical specialist at the right period of time. Great. What's the name of the website? Uh, DevelopedSpace.info, and it would be slash medical uh, for the medical uh, side and slash settlement for, for the others. So, um, the, uh, what I would say is that if, if we are doing just exploration, if we're sending people and coming back, I think uh, what you're talking about applies. You, you need the medical personnel to be there uh, for, for that. If, if you're having mostly one-way transit where people are going to settle and, and then they're, they're settling down on Mars, they may come back, but mostly they're going to stay. Then what happens, I think you can plan things to where uh, the, the first people going are probably going to be international astronauts that are going to be rather healthy and they're, they're not going to statistically the odds that they're going to develop a, a number of things is going to be relatively low and yet you can send highly trained physicians of different specialty and you can build up a group of specialists there and then as you start getting into private settlers that I think are going to tend to be older people because they're long enough to save up money to go uh, then some of those people would actually go and could work in in their field and that includes the dentist and you know nursing etc you could actually by, by, by arranging your push people forward who have the skills that it's going to need, you can grow a, a, a population of healthcare workers before the really older and more, more less healthy people arrive. So I think there's a way of managing it. I, I think that's a great comment, and, and it's a great idea. I believe also that it, 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 will create a, uh, it could create uh, an ethical conflict from Earth um, if we any nation, if we, I don't think we will do it, but if any other nation send a group of people um, willing to die no matter what, no return, um, it will create an ethical dilemma if we cannot at least provide um, services at the end of the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but what the idea is very good. I mean, creating a, a population of, of individuals, the, even the problem with the healthy individuals is that all these incidents that have happened in NASA, um, uh, NASA uh, with the astronauts of renal colic, appendix pains. I mean, all of these problems happen in people perfectly trained that went through everything. Right. And there are microscopic air lesions in the body, in the brain that uh, we can't um, diagnose or problems we can't predict that will happen. We know that. We, we, we've seen in the hospital somebody that we know would, we've been studying, pass away. And what was the reason? We don't really know. It's sad to say that sometimes we don't know. But that's a great, that's a great point. Sir? Yeah, so slight tangent. Um, just wanted to get your opinion on bacteriophages versus antibiotics. Bacteria, I'm sorry? Bacteriophages? For like a viral treatment for bacteria. Oh, bacteriophages versus antibiotic. I think it's good. Both are good. I think it's important, uh, the, the, the concept of balance. Uh, definitely some infections you can uh, take chances. We know with antibiotics, the use of antibiotics and, and group studies for many years, we know resistance, we know effectiveness, we know side effects. Um, there may be some experimental technologies these days that we could apply in the future. Well, so to that end specifically, because um, bacteria pages are very experimental in the US, but I know that they've been used quite widely in Russia. So that's kind of yeah, what what I would do is before incorporating that to a spaceship, and then I don't, I'm not aware if NASA have used that at any point. But if you have some info, please bring it on. But um, uh, the importance is that when we have a problem starting 
in early stages in a long trip, we, we, we want to address that immediately. We, and we need to know what the use will be for that new technology, in what population, in what specific cases, how much that weight to take that to the space. It's another another concept important. How much you wait versus how much you know. If, if one antibiotic we can use it for 20 problems, maybe this is more useful than the other technology. But that's that's also somewhat something valuable. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, this is a complicated question, but I'm going to have to ask three quick answers because are you familiar with all the new work being done, with longevity studies like Walter Longo here at USC and David Sinclair at Harvard? They propose a radical new solution, which is that, uh, to be able to use the epigenome to uh, enable a backup copy of any given organ or system. That's interesting. That's interesting. I, I would like to know what the Vatican thinks about it. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. But uh, it, yeah, um, um, those, are, those are technologies that might be good for colonization and maybe start being used in Mars. The, the good thing about Mars is that it's a completely separate universe that doesn't have to be followed by the rules that we have on Earth that results from living in, in a society or in, in, in the history and going through medieval times and all these things to get to certain rules. Maybe there we can do some other things like Dr. Surin says, if this is not prohibited, why not? I mean, we may do it, yeah. there's no problem. It's us, it's up to us, up to the people who are living there what they're going to do in March. But that's, that's another good idea. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.